the record though. Okay, Alex just started the recording. So maybe I would love to Raymond if we want to kick off. Or we want to wait other minute. What do you think, Ray Raymond? Uh, let's see. How, how are we? Uh, we can wait uh, one more minute and then we'll get uh, started. Thank you. All right. That's good. So the number of attendees is increasing. Uh, you also have a chat to use uh, during this event where you can interact with, uh, with me, with Alex, uh, with Jonathan, uh, with Sylvan from Figures. So don't hesitate to write us messages. And of course, be aware that the chat allows you to write messages uh, to either single or specific persons in the panelists. Uh, this, or if you want, you can also write messages to all the participants in order to share your thoughts and your questions with the full audience. Okay, Marco, I think we're good to start. All right. Uh, welcome. Welcome uh, to everyone. It's my pleasure to kick off this event. Uh, you can see the first slide already streamed. The workshop is uh, Parallel Computing with MATLAB uh, Part 2. Many of you uh, that I see from the attendees uh, list have been uh, already with us uh, for the event uh, number one that was uh, Parallel Computing with MATLAB uh, Part 1 uh, that has been held in the beginning of uh, June uh, with uh, our colleagues from uh, MATLAB, Raymond Norris, Jonathan Murray, and also Sebastian Gross. Uh, and this is the Part 2. The Part 2 it, uh, will be about how to scale parallel computing with MATLAB to the uh, nationwide HPC center of Stupitec Truba. Uh, that you see with the main logo at the center of the, uh, this uh, slide. Uh, therefore, if uh, your goal is uh, scaling your computational e effort to the nationwide cluster to be the two if you want to run batch jobs, parallel computation, uh, and provide an understanding of the caveats in running in this cluster, you are in the right place. Welcome from my side, I'm Marco Rossi, customer success en engineer for MathWorks, dedicated uh, Turkish uh, Academia. Uh, together with me, uh, the speakers of today's talk is uh, Raymond uh, Norris, uh, application engineer at MathWorks in the uh, parallel computing team, talking to you from Natic uh, USA. And in the chat, there will be different uh, persons to support you. Uh, there is uh, me, Alex Tarkini from MathWorks, uh, Jonathan Morri from MathWorks, and also uh, Sylvan Schwaller uh, from uh, Figures. Uh, in today's talks, uh, we will have also uh, two academics uh, from the University of Bilkent, uh, Dr. Kate Maggi and uh, Dr. Michael Barbier, two researchers in the Simply Complex Lab at Bilkent University. Let me uh, welcome also them. Thank you for your participation. Also, a special thanks uh, also uh, to, to Pictet Truba for the collaboration that we have put it uh, in place. And a big thank you also to Figas. Uh, MathWorks official reseller in uh, Turkey for the help in the organization of this event. With that, um, welcome also to the audience, to everyone. Uh, I will be very happy now to give the stage to uh, Raymond Norris that will uh, start uh, the talk. Raymond, welcome and thank you so much for being here. 
Well, great. Thanks, Marco. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone, this afternoon to our second part of Parallel Computing with MATLAB. Um, what I'd like to do is sort of set the stage of what we're going to be uh, doing today. Um, for those who were able to attend our part one workshop um, last uh, month, uh, you know that we spent a, a fair amount of time focusing on the MATLAB parallel language. So that is that we were learning what a, a parallel for loop is, what a parallel pool is, SPMD, GPU arrays, and so forth. So our focus really was, you know, how do we run our code uh, uh, locally uh, on our host machine, how do we debug, troubleshoot, prototype our parallel application, et cetera. But at some point, uh, you'll need to perhaps uh, extend those resources uh, to other compute, uh, and that's really where we're going to be focusing today. So our focus is going to be understanding once we've parallelized our code locally on our host machine, what are the, um, what's the process um, in order to be able to scale to an HPC cluster such as Truba, which is what our focus is on today. So where last month we were talking about the parallel computing toolbox, um, today the, uh, all the focus is going to be on using the MATLAB parallel server. As Marco uh, mentioned, uh, we strongly uh, encourage folks to actively participate uh, in today, uh, and when you do, we ask that you at least uh, post to the um, host, presenter, and panelists. Um, I will do the best I can to monitor the chat, but really we have an excellent team that's monitoring uh, the chat, uh, and they'll be able to answer questions as I'm talking. Um, however, um, I think your questions are questions that everyone has, so if you're encouraged to um, or you're comfortable, if you could uh, uh, submit it to all attendees, so that way we can all see the questions and, and when the um, when the staff are answering the questions, we'll all get to see those answers and so forth. So. Okay, um, so be before we get started though, um, what I'd like to do is uh, bring in um, our guest uh, speakers today. Um, they will be talking about how they went about um, actually using the MATLAB parallel server uh, to scaling their code. Um, uh, and they'll, they'll talk about a little of their study. Uh, they'll talk about how they did go about uh, running things locally, and uh, as well as running things on the Truber cluster. So with that, Alex, I'd like if you could um, uh, make presenters our guest speakers uh, uh, this afternoon uh, to have them walk us through their findings. And uh, Gait, you're now a uh, presenter and can share your screen. Yes, thank you. So you can see my screen now, right? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you, uh, Raymond. Thank you, Alex, Marco, and everyone. Uh, I'm Rex McKee from uh, Simply Complex Lab, which is located in Bilkan University, UNA, and led by Serum Elda. Uh, in this group, we are interested in uh, systems operating under far from equilibrium conditions such as uh, high nonlinearity, strong stochasticity, and the presence of intrinsic positive and negative feedback mechanisms. Uh, one of the topics that interests us is the uh, uh, universality, uh, namely that multiple unrelated systems, which can be physical, mathematical, or social, uh, who share similar behavior in some aspects, uh, so that sharing is called universality, and one example of that is the mysterious Fresh-Weedon distribution, uh, which is uh, similar to Galton distribution, but with this uh, positive or negative sequence. Uh, so this distribution, this distribution shows up in uh, fluctuations among those unrelated systems, and is expected to show up in uh, some weird places like uh, in the distribution of photoreceptors in uh, avian retina. Uh, for us, we want really to study and investigate the presence of uh, that distribution. Uh, so for that, we constructed a flexible experimental setup uh, at which we have a microscope slide, there is water, and within the water there are swimming particles or organisms. And we shine out the fast laser, the laser hits the sample and forms some flows, the flows attract the particles and aggregation form and interact uh, in feedback mechanism with the flows themselves. So we have aggregation with the growing. Uh, and we studied the 
uh, temporal fluctuations uh, of the average uh, radius of growth, and we found a trace rhythm distribution with them. And that was interesting because it was the first reporting of temporal trace rhythm distribution, which was expected to show up in the roughness of the boundary of the aggregation, not in the uh, growth in time itself. Uh, that was published in Nature Physics, and now we are interested in understanding why uh, we, we got temporal trace rhythm distribution. Uh, within mathematical uh, framework. So we go to KBZ equation, which is used to, uh, I mean, widely to simulate uh, or to, to understand the growth of uh, nonlinear aggregation. So we have properties going down and we have growth going up and roughness uh, also increase in time. So K the traditional KBZ equation has uh, term for spatial nonlinearity, diffusion, and randomness, and all those are along the interface. Uh, and long story short, we decided to add two other things which show temporal nonlinearity, so along time and temporal diffusion. Uh, and uh, we want to uh, take the situation and see if it can uh, really explain the results that we get in the experiment. The point here is that this equation, the partial differential equation with multiple terms, and we have multiple constants with large uh, spectrum of values, which is the balance between different terms. Uh, the study is uh, statistical, so needless to say that we need a huge amount of points along the interface, many uh, time steps, and for that we really need the help of Truva Barrel Server, and it came to help and that's what uh, my colleague Michael will explain now. So, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ray. Uh, so, as Ray said, uh, we have a lot of data points to compute, and this code is uh, perfectly parallelizable. So, uh, so first, uh, for that reason, we first parallelized uh, our code, which is a MATLAB script, uh, to run on our own computers in parallel. And basically for that, we just uh, switched from a for loop to a par for loop. Uh, then to further scale up uh, this workflow, um, we wanted to uh, implement this on the Truba cluster. So for that, uh, we basically uh, required the license uh, and we actually had a pretty smooth, let's say, transfer uh, from uh, our own computers to uh, executing in parallel on the uh, Truba cluster, as uh, most of the things are similar. Uh, the only thing, and which you probably already know, is that the uh, job queue, instead of instantaneous uh, execution, uh, you have a job queue you uh, submit your job and you don't look uh, further uh, to it. Um, but then in, in our hands, let's say, I just want to give a, a quick um, a heads up. Uh, we really had to optimize the number of processes versus the number of threads. Um, I, it might be that the MATLAB experts will uh, uh, mention this uh, today as well. Um, now, and then I just want to uh, give you the experiments, uh, ex uh, our experience uh, on the performance uh, on the uh, slide on the right. And uh, if we zoom in on that uh, part, then these are um, here we did some tests. Uh, so we have three different tasks that we uh, tested, so three different scripts, and we tested them on basically four computers. So we have two laptops, one master student's laptop and one uh, PhD student's laptop of our lab. Then we have a workstation in our lab, which is um, uh, a new uh, high-end workstation. And then we have the Truva cluster. And we executed all the same test scripts, uh, which ran only for a short time. Uh, the details of the computers you can see here on the right. Uh, and on the left, I showed you uh, on the graph the different timings, um, and then let's watch, uh, sorry, let's look at uh, laptop um, in blue and the, basically blue in the red bar. 
um, then you see that for task one and two, the laptops are definitely uh, slower than uh, the uh, Truba cluster, which is uh, denoted in uh, purple. Um, and we definitely got a speed up there, um, and, and this definitely scaled up. Um, now, I, I just want to mention, so we also added here a workstation, which is in our lab. Um, but, and so it kind of gives this about the same results in uh, timings for the first two, two tasks. Um, the fact that it gives the same uh, time is kind of expected. Uh, we actually asked for the same amount of workers uh, in the same worker configuration on those two computers. We just wanted to see uh, what our experience of this workstation, which, which is not in a queuing system, let's say, uh, versus on um, the cluster. And, um, and, and this should give about the same result, and it does. Uh, the only thing is, of course, the cluster is scalable. Uh, so if we want to, let's say, execute more scripts on the cluster, we can just ask for more cores uh, while uh, our workstation, it's, it's a single workstation. If we want to execute more codes, then we need to buy another workstation, of course. Um, then for the last task, I, I also just, I, we, we executed this hyper uniformity analysis task. And we, at first, it was a bit off, so the, the Truba cluster was um, taking actually longer. But uh, then we looked into this task, and we saw that like 80% of the work was visualization. So 80% of the time, the computer was doing basically visualization tasks, which are not parallelizable. And because this is uh, sequential, uh, it doesn't really matter how many cores you allow this code to use, it will just mostly use one core. Uh, so most of the time it is not, uh, nothing is being uh, sped up and, and, and that you see in this graph. So if you have a code which is not parallelizable, uh, then you need to either execute it on your own computer or you need to split the parts which are uh, sequential and uh, ones which are uh, parallelizable. Um, and then I want to uh, wrap up just to say that we are currently uh, also testing other codes on the Truba clustering, uh, cluster other than the Tracy Widom uh, scripts and we are seeing which ones we can upscale or, or increase the performance of uh, by using the Truba cluster and also some uh, codes we, we actually think that they would be very good, uh, also highly parallelizable codes, which would be good to test and, and maybe use the Truba cluster also within our group in the uh, future. And with that, I'd like to thank you all uh, for listening and we are open to uh, any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. Um, as uh, Marco mentioned, uh, if anyone has any does have any questions, please uh, feel free to post them uh, in the chat, uh, and our guest speakers will certainly be keeping a, an eye on that, and we'll be happy to answer any any follow on questions. Um, I do want to um, I, I do want to uh, come back to actually uh, to their slide uh, at the very end. Um, I, I think there was some really good um, observations that were made. Uh, as far as timing and so forth, so I'm, I'm going to pull that last slide in um, towards the end. Um, but I, I want to focus on uh, one comment that Michael had just mentioned that I think is worth mentioning now, and that is that um, there's a lot to consider when you're paralyzing your code. And I, I thought his observation of seeing what is that you can truly paralyze is very important when it comes to um, timing and setting expectations. And so I'll, I'll make a very simple example. Uh, I imagine that the code that I want to speed up takes 10 hours. And maybe there's uh, two hours of some data cleansing and importing of data and so forth that can't be serialized. And then there's maybe another two or three hours of post-processing, you know, whether it's generating a report, plotting, et cetera. 
um, that also couldn't be paralyzed. But it's that sort of middle chunk of five hours um, that's the heavy compute. So we could throw a thousand computers at it, and the best that we can do is get a two time speed improvement, right? If we go from 10 hours, let's say we can drive that five hour compute down to zero, we're still left with five hours of uh, pre and post processing, graphics, excuse me, et cetera. So we can only get a two time speed improvement, right? So really what we're focusing on, not is timing everything, but timing um, that which can actually be uh, paralyzed. And in part one, some of the things that we talked about are the tools that you have at your disposal, right? So first and foremost is that you want to use the MATLAB profiler, right? And so this you can find uh, in your, let me, uh, let me bring, um, well, uh, when I bring MATLAB up, uh, I'll show you where we can find it. Um, but the, the, the profiler will instrument your code to identify those areas of your code that are running faster or slower than other parts. The second um, is uh, using the code analyzer to help identify where you can make improvements um, to those pieces of code that are running slow. So for instance, vectorization, pre-allocation, et cetera. Once you've identified what's taking long, why it's taking long, then you can start figuring out um, what things you can do and whether <laughs> it's using a, a parallel for loop locally or running things on Truba, et cetera. Uh, that's really where we're gonna be focusing, of course, today. So. Um, thanks again, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Great observations. And again, I, I'm going to circle back to some of the, the points in the chart um, talking about the workstation versus Truba uh, towards the end of the presentation. So today we're going to um, uh, go until uh, close to the four o'clock hour. Um, we'll, uh, it, this is unlike uh, part one, which is more of a um, uh, hands-on workshop. Uh, this is more of a lecture format, so it will be very much of a do-as-I-do uh, presentation. So I would encourage you to follow along in those places where it makes sense to do the same things that I'm doing, and I'll, I'll show you where that is. Um, uh, but there are other parts where I'll simply be talking through and talking about some key points and, and whatnot. So the first thing that I want to say is that uh, today's lecture is really all about um, process and not performance. And what I mean by that is that, uh, of course, understandably, I simply don't have time to run a 45-minute example and show that we can run it in five minutes or 10 minutes and so forth. Instead, what I want to walk you through is the, the process of being able to have your MATLAB desktop, uh, or rather, MATLAB running on your desktop system, being able to submit jobs to the cluster, right? So these are going to be very contrived examples, uh, but it's talking more about uh, the workflow of how we're going to submit jobs to the cluster, get results back, uh, be able to determine if there are issues, how do we troubleshoot, uh, if you were going to put in a help ticket, um, how do you go about, uh, you know, what information might you need to, to do that. Um, and then in the end, we'll talk about um, even licensing and, and next steps and, and so forth. So. All right. Um, the presentation is being recorded, and we'll also have um, these slides posted uh, on the um, on the site uh, that, you, that you'll have access to momentarily. Um, the, the link that I've provided here um, is a work in progress. Uh, we'll be updating uh, this user guide. However, uh, I've included uh, the user guide in the, uh, the support package, which we'll uh, work with in, in a moment. The last thing is um, hopefully everyone's aware that um, it's uh, in order to uh, participate, actively participate uh, in the workshop today, that you need to have both MATLAB and the Parallel Computing Toolbox, and specifically, you need R2021B. And the reason is because we've installed already all the software that you need on the cluster. However, it's version specific to R2021B. Um, so the first thing that I would say is that um, if you don't currently have MATLAB, or you do, but it's not 21B, please uh, continue to um, stay on um, and, and uh, watch what we're doing. I, I, again, there, there'll be a couple of times where we submit jobs to the cluster, but I think you'll learn uh, a great deal, even if, you're not, uh, even if you don't have MATLAB or R2021B installed on today. The second is that uh, if you have an older version or a, or a newer version, rather, uh, so maybe you're running 22A, uh, et cetera, um, please let us know, uh, specifically uh, let the, the Chupatech folks know um, so that perhaps we can get uh, a newer version installed uh, on the cluster as well. Everything that we're talking about today is backward compatible all the way to R2017A. We just need to know what versions that you're running and what versions you'd like to see on the cluster, and perhaps we can make um, some uh, adjustments for that. 
And the last thing is, is you know, uh, that, you know, it requires obviously having an account on, on Truba. Um, if anyone does not have an account uh, on Truba, please uh, post something uh, in the chat. Uh, Marco and Alex, I'm going to put you on the spot momentarily. I believe you received the email uh, from the Tubet Tech folks yesterday. Um, and so if you could look at that, uh, and if there happen to be some folks who don't have an account on Truba, uh, please uh, make use of that list. Uh, it is a unique list, and what I mean by that is that only one person can use it at a time uh, for uh, technical reasons. So. Okay, uh, so maybe if anyone could just throw in the chat, if they don't have MATLAB installed right now, or if they don't have 21B, uh, version 21B specifically, with the Parallel Computing Toolbox, or if you don't have Truba, uh, have a Truba account, if you could please post that in the chat, and then we'll try to adjust as, as we can. But with that said, um, I'd like to get started. Okay, so I think it's important to sort of understand um, the basic workflow of how we're going to get jobs running from your MATLAB client to the cluster, right? So everything that we're going to focus on today is using what I'm going to refer to as remote submission. That is, from your university, you have already installed uh, and are using MATLAB and the Parallel Computing Toolbox, right? So your host machine, whether that's Windows, Linux, or Mac, um, is going to be running MATLAB. On the cluster side is where we've installed the MATLAB parallel server. So that's already taken care of for you. Um, and really, I'd like folks to think of the MATLAB parallel server as really being almost identical to MATLAB, except for it simply doesn't run a graphical interface, right? So we're going to be um, running these MATLAB processes that we call workers. Um, in order to um, scale your code across multiple cores, multiple nodes, et cetera. All right. And the way that we're going to do that is introducing the batch command. Now, for those who have already written uh, parallel code, whether it's you've already been writing it for a while or it was when you learned about it last month, really our focus was using uh, parpool. Uh, parpool uh, allows you to r run an interactive session uh, versus batch is more of a non-interactive session. And, and I'm going to spend a little more time in another slide or two uh, to talk about the differences. But the, the primary difference is that with the batch command, it allows us to um, automatically generate, uh, in this case, a Slurm job script on our local machine. We're going to copy it over to the cluster, and then we're going to submit that job uh, on your behalf. And so when you look at um, the way that this works, uh, you'll start to see that there are certain configurations or certain parameters that we can specify for Slurm through the MATLAB API. Right? And, and again, that's through the, the batch command. Now, the nice thing about the batch command is that it's asynchronous. That means that um, it doesn't block MATLAB um, from doing other things like calling other functions, uh, quitting MATLAB, and so forth. But certainly one of the things that it could also do is just submit another batch job. Right? So while your first job is being run on the cluster, you could launch uh, another MATLAB uh, parallel job onto the cluster as well. And I think this starts to become where, you know, it's, you know uh, we sort of think of HPC as high productivity computing, where you're going to have the ability to seamlessly, from your MATLAB uh, client, be able to communicate to the cluster all staying within the MATLAB environment. Now, some of you may already be familiar with Truba um, or your own HPC cluster at your university. You may be familiar with schedulers like Slurm or PBS and so forth. Uh, what we're going to show you today is the ability that you can do all of this from within the MATLAB environment uh, and not need to necessarily connect to the cluster uh, to get the status of the job and so forth. So we'll show you how all of that works uh, in a moment. Okay. Um, for the MathWorks folks, um, I'm, uh, I'm not really going to be paying much attention to the chat, so please uh, interrupt me if there's something that I need to uh, address. All right, so with that said, uh, let's talk about this notion of profiles. So uh, you've been using a local profile, whether you're aware of that or not, when you start a local pool on your host machine. So what is a profile? Um, a profile is a way for MATLAB to discover as well as interface to a scheduler. Right? So it provides hooks 
uh, in order to do that. And the analogy that I like to make is um, uh, th think about uh, your printer, right? So you may be writing a Word document, and from that Word document, you want to send your document to printer A because it can print uh, both uh, black and white, but also color. But printer B uh, provides the ability to print on the front and the back, right? And so in the Word document, you wouldn't have anything that really describes, well, because I'm going to be sending this to printer A, let's do this or printer B this. You sort of delineate or differentiate uh, the resources that you need with the code that you want to run, right? So um, what I'm going to do now is uh, we're going to create a new profile uh, for the uh, for uh, for Truva. Okay, so uh, Jonathan, if you could please post uh, in the um, WebEx chat the first link that I have here. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to give everyone access to the Truva MATLAB support package. The support package uh, is a collection of scripts and documentation um, that we're going to use in order for uh, to create a new profile. Rather than the local profile, we're now going to create a, uh, a Truva profile. And this information uh, explains to MATLAB how it can submit jobs to the cluster, how it can get the state of the job, and how it can delete jobs. These are the three things that MATLAB has to be able to do. And because MATLAB can do these things, this is what prevents the need for you to connect to the cluster yourself uh, and get uh, the status of a job or delete the job and so forth. Okay, uh, so Jonathan, have you posted uh, uh, the link? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, great, excellent. Okay, so uh, a, a couple of things that I wanna mention. Uh, first and foremost, um, I've posted this support package uh, on our MathWorks FTP site. This link uh, will be good, <clears throat> excuse me, for almost two months, right? So plenty of time, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, however, ultimately, really what we're gonna do is we're gonna post this on the Truba site. I'll be working with um, the Truba Tech folks uh, shortly after this workshop, uh, and we'll get all of this posted uh, on, onto, uh, on, onto the site. Um, okay, so what I'd like folks to do is um, to click on uh, the link that Jonathan has provided. You're going to log in with the username of Lakeside, and then the password is going to be the number one all lowercase letters Q, I, the number six, R, four, seven, and the letter F. And if you're able to connect to our FTP site successfully, uh, you should see uh, a link, or you should see a, a site uh, with these three files right here. So uh, to begin with, if anyone uh, is having any problems connecting to the FTP site, uh, please post it in the WebEx chat, uh, and one of the folks uh, from MathWorks will uh, will work on it. Uh, will will help you uh, troubleshoot it. So let me explain uh, what these files are. The first is getting started with Serial and Parallel MATLAB, uh, which is a Word document. Um, this uh, is what I was mentioning earlier. Will be eventually posted um, on, on the Truba site. Uh, it describes everything that we're going to do today. The important thing to understand about this getting started guide is that it is a what I call a, a shim doc, uh, which is a sort of a, a bridge between uh, the MATLAB parallel computing documentation, uh, which teaches you about a parallel for loop, uh, par, uh, par eval, uh, distributed arrays, and so forth, as well as the Truba um, uh, Slurm documentation, where you understand more about uh, setting wall times, um, getting email notifications, and so forth. What this Word document simply does is it explains how we're gonna create a profile and how we're gonna submit jobs to the cluster. It assumes you already know something about a MATLAB parallel for loop and assumes that you already have, for instance, a Truva account and whatnot. Okay, uh, the next two are archive files. Um, they are identical. Um, the file extension dictates whether you should click one for Linux and Mac OS, which is the tar.gz, or the zip file for Windows users. You only need to download one, you don't need to download both. 
The second is I just want to clarify that when I use the term R2022A, it simply means that when we built this support package for you, uh, we did it using the R2022A MATLAB code base, right? So um, again, the, this uh, set of scripts, or these plugin scripts, are backward compatible all the way to 17A. So this just tells you the version that I built it on, not the version that is supported. So. Okay, um, any questions that I should be aware of, uh, MathWorks? Okay, great. So uh, let's talk about how we're going to install the support package. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna first, I'm gonna work with the Windows users, and then I'm gonna work with the Linux Mac, o, uh, Mac OS users. Now, this, this piece right here um, is, is very important. Um, when you download uh, the zip file, it's important that you place it into a very specific location. And the location I'd like you to unzip um, the, 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 the archive file is going to be the same location that MATLAB returns when you call user path, all lowercase one word. This is my user path. Your user path is going to be slightly different. Uh, but the reason that we're putting it here is because every version of MATLAB sees this same location. And what this means is that we can install this uh, support package in one location, and if you update your version of MATLAB, um, it uh, <clears throat> they will see the same version as well. I mean, they'll, they'll see the same um, location. So we don't need to install it in different versions of MATLAB. Okay. So that's the first piece that's important. The second is the way that you install it. So when you extract um, the zip file, it's important that the contents of the um, zip file is exactly placed within Documents MATLAB. Most often when you extract the zip file, you'll notice that it will uh, append, for instance, the name of the zip file so that it now is in a subdirectory. And the reason it's important that the files are placed exactly in this location is because this is on your MATLAB path. Okay? So user path is only one folder, and it is on your MATLAB path. What is not on your MATLAB path is slash, uh, you know, uh, non-shared, et, et cetera, R2022A and, and whatnot. If for some reason you've already extracted it and you placed it into a subdirectory, it's important then that you take the entire contents and place it uh, into uh, whatever user path returns. Okay, I'm gonna come back to the slide in a second, but I wanna flip over now to the Linux Mac OS users. For you, um, what, what you need to do is, um, and actually, I, I'm missing, I apologize, I need to fix one little typo here, number 18, FP. So uh, what I'd like you to do is call make dir, and then I apologize that I'm missing a dash. Actually, you know what? Um, I'm gonna put it in for right now. Oh, actually, I, I, can't, I can't do it. Um, uh, let me, I'll put it right in here. And I'll put right here. So it should be uh, make. Uh, make your dash p tilde documents MATLAB, and that should be lowercase m. And let me just highlight uh, what I was um, missing there. Okay. So uh, what I'd like you to do is make dir, and then that's a single dash, p uh, tilde slash documents MATLAB. And then from there, I'd like you to call tar extract file. And then I'm going to assume that um, you downloaded the tar file uh, onto into your home directory, but really you would replace this with wherever um, you downloaded the tar file from. And then dash capital C, tilde slash, and then documents MATLAB, just as we typed uh, above here. Once that's done, you can take a look at the listing by typing ls minus one tilde slash documents slash MATLAB. And you should see a listing identical to this right here, or certainly very, maybe it's not color coded, but whatever. 
Okay, so before we go any further, it's important that everyone is able to successfully do what I've just shown. Um, so I'd like everyone to put a check mark next to your name in uh, WebEx, um, showing that you've um, successfully um, downloaded the support package uh, as well as um, uninstalled it or, or extracted it. Okay, I'm starting to see a couple of check marks. That's great. Um, if you're having any troubles at all, please put a red mark next to your name. Uh, and one of the folks from um, um, from the panel uh, will be able to um, help you out. But I, I would like to wait just to make sure that uh, everyone has a check mark next to your name. If if you can't put a mark next to your name for whatever reason, just put it into the into the chat, and, and we'll see that uh, that you're done. So. All right, so I'm, I'm only seeing a couple of people with check marks next to their name. So I, I do want to make sure that there weren't any uh, complications downloading or uh, extracting uh, into the user path. So um, I count at least 10 of them, Raymond. Yeah, OK. OK. Uh, so uh, Jonathan raised a good point that maybe perhaps uh, – so if you don't have R2021B, you should still uh, do what we're doing here because, again, this uh, – eventually when you do install 21B, uh, 21B will see this. So uh, good point, Jonathan, uh, but just to alleviate anyone's concerns, uh, if you don't have 21B, you should still follow along with what we're doing. So, Okay. Um, I, again, these slides will be made available to you as is the recording. So with that in mind, um, why don't we uh, continue? So, All right. Uh, so we've downloaded uh, the support package and we've unzipped the archive into the user path directory. The next thing that we need to do is we have to configure MATLAB uh, so that we have a Trooper profile. So what I'd like everyone to do is um, start MATLAB. Uh, if you haven't already, and then I'm going to ask you to call uh, right, uh, run uh, config cluster. Config cluster is one word, uh, and it is camel case, which means that the first word is lowercase, and then the second word, uh, the first letter is uh, capitalized, so that's a capital C. And I'm going to clear everyone from. Um, good. And so when you do so, uh, you will be prompted for your username on Truba. And this is not going to be your university username that you're using at your university, but instead um, you would have uh, an account on Truba, and that's the user ID that you should use. So obviously um, you're going to replace this with whatever uh, is the name of your, you know, whatever your user ID is on the cluster. And uh, let me um, um, sorry, let me one second. Uh, So if, uh, if folks could put a check mark next to their name uh, once they've called uh, to big cluster. Mm -hmm.
Okay, good. I, I see a couple folks. Now, uh, I was mentioning a, a, a moment ago that you need to, um, that you can do, you can install the support package regardless of the version of MATLAB. Um, however, in order to call config cluster, you do have to now have um, uh, R2021 be installed. Okay, so I'll follow along uh, as well. Great. Uh, so at this point, everyone should see um, something identical uh, to what we have here. Right? So the, uh, we've got a, a new profile that's been created called Truva R2021B. Uh, and what it's suggesting is that we need to specify the wall time. Right? So I mentioned in the beginning is that MATLAB is going to generate a Slurm uh, uh, job script for us, and we're going to it's going to copy it over for you onto the cluster and submit it. Um, one of the requirements to submitting the job onto the cluster is that we specify a wall time. And we're going to do that through this notion of additional properties of the cluster object. But before we get uh, too far, let me just show that uh, the way that you know you've successfully done this is if you go to the parallel menu item on your home tool, uh, tool strip, right? So I'm going to go make sure I'm on the home uh, tool strip. And then I'm going to see a parallel menu item, which is right next to the three boxes. And when I select parallel and I just hover over select a default cluster, I'm going to notice a couple of things. The first is that not only do I have local, but now I have Truva R2021B. The second thing is that you'll notice there's a check mark next to it. That means it's the default profile. So when I was making that analogy earlier about a Word document, uh, we all have, uh, you know, maybe we have access to multiple printers, but we all have at least, well, well, we have one printer that is our default printer, right? So that if I say, if I'm at, with my Word document and I hit Control P to print, if I don't do anything, if I just hit Enter, it's going to automatically send that document to my default uh, printer. Uh, but certainly I could change uh, what my default printer is. I could also, within the Word document, I could say, well, I want to override rather than using printer A, I want to send this one time just to printer B instead. So we can specify, we can change our default uh, uh, profile, uh, or um, we can um, specify the profile we want to we want to use when we're calling uh, batch, par cluster, par pool, et cetera. And I'll explain that now. So I'm going to make a call to par cluster, and I'm going to assign it uh, a variable C. Uh, it's not terribly important the name of the variable that you call. You know, sometimes I've, I've seen, for instance, cluster equals or whatever the case is. Um, I'm just going to simply use um, the letter C for cluster, and I'm going to assign it to the output argument of calling par cluster. And I'm going to hit, I'm going to use a semicolon to suppress the output. Okay. Now, C is a MATLAB object. Um, an object has properties and it has methods. Right? So properties are different fields, and one of those uh, properties is called additional properties. And MATLAB has tab completion that allows me just to type a couple of letters, and then if I hit the tab button, it will automatically fill in the rest of the, the name. And what I need to do is I need to set the wall time, and again, I'm going to just type WA, I'm going to hit tab, and that also will autocomplete. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to tell MATLAB to cr when I'm creating the job script <clears throat> that this job will take a certain amount of time. And it's important that you, that the wall time that you provide um, is reasonably accurate. <clears throat> so what do I mean by reasonably accurate and why is this important? So if I think my job is going to take um, three hours to run, then I might say, well, I think actually it will take about four hours uh, at the most. And the reason that this is important to specify is two reasons. One, first and foremost, if you tell um, Truba that your job will take three hours to run, if your job exceeds three hours, uh, the scheduler will automatically terminate your job. So regardless of if you're 80 or 90% of the way done, if you say that your job will take three hours to run and it continues to run after three hours, the scheduler will automatically terminate your job and you will lose um, everything you did during the job. The second reason it's important is because it helps actually to schedule your jobs. Um, <clears throat> depending on the resources that you need, it's possible that 
if, uh, if your job will say only needs 10 minutes to run, that the scheduler might say, well, there are lots of jobs ahead of you, right? Because this, uh, keep in mind, this is a shared resource amongst many universities. So there may be other jobs that were submitted before you. However, they require additional resources that the scheduler is waiting on. And if you say you can finish your job in five or 10 minutes, uh, that it, the scheduler may consider starting your job sooner than it normally would. So giving it an accurate wall time allows for the scheduler to determine how quickly it can start um, your job. But on the back side, it's also important that um, you give it a re, uh, realistic time so that uh, the scheduler doesn't kill your job too soon. Okay, so um, the the uh, the nomenclature of specifying uh, time is seconds, minutes, and hours. Uh, and, in, and and for today, uh, none of our jobs are going to come close to running even 15 or 10 minutes. But just to be on the safe side, uh, we're going to say 15 minutes. So again, hours, minutes, and seconds. This is another example where it assumes that you know something about the cluster, and if you don't, um, you should refer to the Truba documentation. There are other ways of specifying. So for instance, if I thought it was gonna take uh, one hour, I could specify uh, as such, uh, and so forth. So you know, uh, if you have any questions on the proper way of specifying any of the properties we're gonna talk about today, um, take a look at the Truba documentation. Okay, so um, so there we are. We're going to set um, the wall time to 15 minutes. Um, the other thing that we're going to do today uh, is we're going to specify uh, a reservation. And the name of the reservation is called MATLAB, um, and it's only good for today. I think maybe it expires tomorrow. I'm not really sure, but let's assume it's just for today. And this is going to help uh, ensure that our jobs start sooner than they typically normally would. Um, the, uh, the folks at uh, Tubatech were kind enough to create this reservation for today just so that we could get our jobs um, submitted through because they knew it would be quick. But, uh, you know, after today, uh, you would not use this reservation and you would have to follow uh, the normal um, scheduling policy. All right, so the last thing that we need to do is save our profile. Okay, um, and the reason that we save our profile is because if we don't save the profile, uh, what we're typing here is temporary until MATLAB exits. Once MATLAB exits, if we didn't save the profile, then these properties would uh, go back to their default uh, values, which is empty and empty. All right, um, I'm gonna pause there for a second. Uh, hopefully everyone's been following along with what I've been doing, uh, but I wanna just check to see if there are any questions I should answer. Excellent. All right, so we're now ready to submit our first uh, job. Um, the, um, the one thing I would say is calling config cluster is only done once. Its only responsibility is to create this profile. Um, now, all, anytime you start up R2021B, the profile will always be there, so you only need to call config cluster once. All right, um, we're gonna be focusing all of our um, time on the batch command, uh, not the parpool, but I do wanna just make some uh, differences between parpool and batch. Parpool um, is typically when you're running things locally and you want to um, have an interactive session where we start the pool of processes, or again, what we call workers, but where uh, we then can call parallel constructs like par4, par eval, and so forth. Um, it's a synchronous execution, which means that you can only have one parallel pool running uh, at a time. The way that things are designed, um, parpool will not work um, from our machine to the cluster because it requires that the workers running on the cluster can communicate back to your host machine, uh, which for all intents and purposes is not feasible. What we are gonna work on today is the batch command. Uh, the batch command has uh, several advantages. Um, first of all, uh, because it's a non-blocking uh, command, it allows us uh, to be able to submit multiple jobs uh, at the same time. And I'll show you at the very end uh, one way that we could have almost like a, a job launcher uh, and so forth. But the second thing is that it doesn't require that the MATLAB client is running 
or our laptop or desktop. So we can shut MATLAB down, um, and then we can um, uh, shut down our uh, sh shut down our laptop and, and, and so forth. Uh, we can uh, reboot our computer, we can restart MATLAB, and then we can get the results of running our batch job uh, at a later time. And I'm going to show you all how we do that uh, through the API. Okay. Um, for those who are not uh, on the on the on the network. Uh, you will need to VPN in at this point uh, if you uh, if you haven't already and you need to. So um, you should do so uh, now. So I'm going to just uh, VPN in. All right. So here we are. We're ready to um, submit our first uh, Hello World job. Right. So. Um, what we're going to do, something actually that's very simple, um, but it's actually, it turns out it's a very important uh, piece of information, and that is when we're running MATLAB on our host machine, we know exactly where uh, MATLAB is running, right? If I just type PWD, uh, that tells me the present working directory, right? Uh, and so it might be in my C drive or maybe it's in my slash home slash Raymond, uh, but we know where MATLAB is running at that time. But if we're going to submit a job onto the cluster, <clears throat> would we even know where um, MATLAB is running on the cluster, right? And the reason that's important to understand is because if we're reading files uh, from our, our current location or if we're going to write files to our current location, it's really important to understand our environment. So let's go ahead and uh, submit our first uh, Hello World job here. Oh, um. Okay, so we're gonna uh, we've already we already have a cluster object, uh, and we're now ready to submit our first job. So I'm gonna type c uh, job equals c dot batch at, and what I'd like everyone to do is just follow along with what I'm doing, and then I'm going to uh, explain. Uh, what everything is. Okay, so job equals c dot batch left parenthesis at pwd comma one comma left curly brace right curly brace comma single quote current folder and you can type cu and then hit the tab and it will auto complete. Um, comma, single quote, period, single quote, right parentheses, semicolon, and then enter. Okay, so if you've done that successfully, then uh, you should be prompted um, regarding your SSH credentials. So MATLAB's going to generate a job script and submit it for you on the cluster. In order to do that, we need to be able to S copy uh, the files over and then SSH uh, to the cluster for you to run those commands. So we already know who you are because we prompted you for your username. What we don't know is how we're going to authenticate you. And we can do that either through um, a private key or what's referred to sometimes as an identity file uh, or through, a, uh, through your password. So for me, I don't have a private key and I would assume that you know, probably most folks do not. Uh, so I'm going to click that I am not going to use an identity file. And instead, I will now be prompted for my password. So at this point, I'll go ahead and All right, so I don't want to go any further than this until I find out that everyone has been able to do it exactly uh, what I've done as well. So I'm going to clear everyone's uh, markings, and what I'd like everyone to do is just take a moment to put either a green check mark next to your name um, or uh, a red mark. Um, and uh, so a green check mark means that uh, you called uh, the command exactly as I've written it here. 
Um, <clears throat> you were prompted for uh, your credentials, um, and uh, you get a line that says additional submit args equals, and you have this output here. Um, if you ran into any technical uh, issues, you should put a red mark next to your name and then uh, list what the issue is. And let me, let me take a moment to look at um, All right. Um, okay. Uh, we have to change this. Uh, so, okay. So uh, there was a question: Do we have to change um, the cluster host to? Uh, we do not. Um, so um, the cluster host of 172 should work perfectly fine. Um, there's an error that says access denied uh, to requested reservation. Okay. So. If for some reason uh, folks are not, uh, if they get an error message saying that, that you have not been added to the reservation, then simply type, uh, so go, go back to c.additionalproperties.reservation equals, and then make this uh, the empty string. So it would look like c.additionalproperties.reservation equals um, uh, the empty string, hit enter, and then save the profile. The truth of the matter is that most likely these jobs will um, start um, quite quickly anyway, uh, and, and it's not imperative. And again, after today, you wouldn't have access to this reservation anyway. Uh, let's see, could not connect to remote, uh, contact the cluster at uh, this business. Um, okay, all right, so could, Could someone, uh, perhaps from the Tubatech, take a look at Mustafa's um, question? Uh, they could not connect to remote host 172. Um, I, uh, Mustafa, I'm, I'm assuming, of course, that you don't, you either don't need to VPN in, or you do, and that you have VPN in. Is that correct? Okay, so Sachuk <laughs> is saying that if you're on the campus, you need, you do need to. So Sachuk, you're saying that you cannot use um, what the 172 address. You have to use Lebrick one. Okay, so um, when I uh, when we built this out, uh, because I do VPN in, I use the 172 address. Um, what I'm hearing is that uh, what I'm hearing is that. So here we are. Are you using the uh, so um so I, you know i I was running the exact same issue actually yesterday. Uh, what this says is that the clock on your desktop machine is ahead of um, of uh, Truba. Um, and I'm one, so this says it's 11 seconds. What I noticed is that yesterday when my desktop machine was within three seconds that, uh, that it worked fine. And then eventually it did, um, eventually it did uh, synchronize. Um, so, okay. Bear with me for one second. So I think I might be able to help you. Um, I'll show you what I did yesterday. 
me just go to uh, So folks, I'm just going to take a moment to um, help um, Safa for a second to help uh, fix his uh, clock. One second. Actually, what I'm going to do, Jonathan, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, put in the chat, um, in our internal chat, I'm going to put, um, what you can find for him. So Jonathan, I just put uh, in our chat the um, the location, and in there you're going to find um, two scripts. Um, there's a uh, Okay, so um, Jonathan, you, if you're on the um, uh, Truba VPN or Truba Tech VPN, you should get off of that. Okay. Go, go to the uh, what I put into our internal um, chat. Go to that location. In there, you'll see two scripts: one's for laptop, one's for desktop. Um, find out from Mustafa whether they have a laptop or a desktop, um, and then look at the contents of those two files and then post that uh, into the chat. It's a bunch of um, windows. Well, okay, I, I should say, Mustafa, what Jonathan's going to send you uh, is for windows. Um, as um, if you go to time.is, it'll tell you whether your clock is off also as well. Uh, thank you for the reminder, Jonathan. Um, all right. so. Let's, um, with that said, let me uh, continue. Uh, yep, okay, thank you, Sifa. So, uh, Sifa was saying you can run NT, NTP date uh, command if you're running on Linux. Um, okay. Um, so, thank you, everyone who's um, helping out to try to, uh, uh, to resolve that. So, all right, let me go back to... Um, okay, so um, at this point now, uh, and, and this is actually uh, a, sort of a good example uh, of, your, of your workflow, right? So you're going to submit a job to the cluster, um, but the question now is, um, is my job finished? Is it even, has it even started running? Uh, and if it has, uh, what's the result and so forth? And the way that we're going to uh, orchestrate all of that is through the job command. I mean, I'm sorry, the job object. 
job object has it also, as I mentioned, uh, an object has properties and, um, and, and methods. And, and so the first properties that we want to uh, uh, find out is um, job.state. Okay, so anytime I'm, when I'm using a, a MATLAB object and then I use the, the dot notation, that allows me to um, start typing some letters and then using tab to autocomplete. So anytime you see me, um, if I'm typing, you know, job dot, and then if, if I hit the tab key, that tells me all the options that I have uh, and so forth. If I hit escape, um, then that will um, remove my, my listing. Okay, great. So I've submitted my job using the MATLAB dash command. I've had MATLAB query the state of the job um, uh, to, to tell me whether it's uh, queued, running, or finished. It tells me it's finished. Now, the, the last thing I want to do is I want to fetch the outputs. Um, and for this, I'm going to type job.fetchoutputs colon, uh, uh, left curly colon, right curly. All right, so I've done a lot here. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, I wanted everyone to follow along with what I'm doing, but now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna sort of, um, I'm gonna unwind and explain everything that we've just done to this point. Okay, so um, the, the, the C variable is a cluster object. I mentioned that it has properties, um, like additional properties, and it has methods like batch. So what do I mean by properties and methods and how, do, how can I differentiate one from the other? A property you can almost think of as being like a field or a name, um, and it's easily identified by the fact that it starts with a capital letter. So it's a, it, it's a sort of a, um, a, a programming pattern or a design pattern um, that for MathWorks, when we create objects, the properties start with a capital letter, and the methods or actions or verbs um, start with a lowercase letter. So that's how you can tell the difference between one and the other. Okay, so we're calling um, the method, which is batch, which is going to submit this job. There are uh, multiple types of input argument, or there's multiple ways of calling batch. Uh, I'm going to focus primarily on this format, uh, but I'll talk about um, a, a different format uh, a little bit later. So in this format, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first specify the function that we want to call. The function in this case is PWD, Print Working Directory. Now, what's important is that we're using the at sign in front of PWD because this makes it a function pointer. And a function pointer delays calling this function until a later time. So I'm not gonna do this right now, but imagine, for instance, if I were to say, um, you know, J equals C dot batch, and then I say PWD. Well, in this case, you know, and with, with the other input arguments. In this case, it would first call PWD, which is in my C drive, and then take that information and then um, pass it to the batch command. Well, of course, that's not what I want to do, right? What I want to do is I want to tell batch the command that I want to call on the cluster is PWD. And the way that we do that is we pass in a function pointer. For some of you who have been using MATLAB for a while, you may refer, you may know that this is referred to as a function function. It is a MATLAB function that takes as an input argument another function. All right, so we're going to pass in uh, the function that we want to call, a pointer to it. The next input argument is the number of output arguments that this function is going to return. Now, what's important is that your function that you write might have four or five output arguments. However, for good reasons, you may only want to return one or two of those output arguments. You could imagine that your, out, your function returns a pass failure, but it also then as a second output argument returns this uh, you know, million by million image that you don't want to have returned. So we can't just look at your function and determine that it has two output arguments and assume that you want both output arguments returned. 
So you need to explicitly tell us how many output arguments that you want to have returned, including perhaps zero. You may want to call your function that has five output arguments and you don't want any of them returned. The next is a MATLAB cell array, which is a, uh, going to be a comma separated list of input arguments that are going to be passed to calling your function. Now, PWD, which is print working directory, of course, doesn't take any input arguments, so our cell array is empty. But to give another example, imagine if maybe, uh, and you don't have to follow along with this, maybe what I want to do is I want to do some portfolio uh, analysis, right? And um, maybe it's going to have uh, two output arguments. <clears throat> and what I'm going to pass in are is uh, Apple. And uh, maybe I want to pass in another uh, Microsoft. I don't, I don't actually know what the, I think that's Microsoft. Um, but then I might also say, well, I want to go back 30 days. And um, I want to do it for, um, you know, that may, maybe, you know, some other information such as, um, you, know, so, you know, you can imagine, you know, skip Sundays or whatever the case is, right? So the point is, is that when we're calling our function, we need to pass as our third input argument to batch is going to be a cell array of all the input arguments that are eventually going to be passed to um, your portfolio analysis um, function. Okay. So at a minimum, this is what's required. Um, and I'm focusing pr uh, primarily on functions. We'll talk about scripts because certainly a lot of MATLAB users write scripts. We'll talk about how we would call a script and, and um, the differences in calling scripts versus functions. But for the, for the time being, we're going to call um, a function. All right. Uh, the next input argument is uh, setting the current folder. Now, uh, you'll see in the next slide what happens if we don't specify the current folder. But in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to specify it to period, which means our home directory. All right. So there it is. Um, we've uh, specified that the function we want to call, how many outputs we want to have returned, uh, a cell array that would contain any, uh, any and all input arguments that we're going to need to call our function, and then uh, we're going to specify that the current folder should be starting in uh, uh, our home directory, which in this example tells us exactly really what, what PWD is going to return, right? Um, we're telling MATLAB to start in the, uh, our current folder in our home directory simply by specifying um, our period here. And, and again, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about current folder in a second. <clears throat> okay, so what you'll see is displayed a partial list of the um, Slurm argument list. For those who are familiar with Truba at, or, or your own cluster and particular Slurm or maybe any other scheduler, you'll know that when you're um, creating a job script, there are going to be certain parameters that are being passed um, to, the, to the scheduler. Um, and so in this case, we can see that we want uh, a single task. Um, it's going to run on a single node. It's going to request 28 cores or threads. Uh, and Michael was talking about this, and I'm gonna, uh, I'll talk more about this in a, in a few slides, because uh, this is a very important um, consideration when we're submitting jobs to Truba. Um, and then we can see that we specified 15 minutes, our, our reservation, um, and that we're running on the, the Hamzi um, partition, which again uh, is very important to understand uh, when it comes to the number of cores we're gonna request. Okay, so I'm gonna move along a little uh, quicker here just to uh, keep us on track. Um, but notice that the, since the, the state of the job is finished, um, we can now um, get the results, right? So everything is going to be using this job object. It's, um, we assign it by calling batch. We're going to get um, the property state. Um, but notice that if we want to get the results of calling that, we're going to call the method. Um, and so that's why it starts with a lowercase f. Um, and then we want all the outputs. Um, so the outputs could have could be of different types. So that's why the out, the fetch uh, rather the outputs is also in a cell array. And so we're indexing saying that we want all of the outputs. In this case, there's just one, um, and that the answer um, is uh, Truba Home. In, for me, R Norris. For you, it would most likely be Truba Home, whatever your user ID is. 
Okay. Um, so I'm curious if uh, if folks had any uh, issues up to this, or let me let me do this the other way. Was uh, was anyone able to successfully fetch their result and get something similar to uh, similar to this? Okay, so I see a couple of folks. Okay, great. Um, was did anyone run into any issues that have not been addressed um, to this point? Okay, not seeing any X marks. Okay, good, excellent. All right, so so let's go on. Um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, calling Park cluster. This is what gets us our handle to our Slurm uh, uh, object, and then calling the batch command is what's going to generate our um, job script uh, that we submit to the cluster. So, all right. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about current folder. You, in theory, you don't need to specify the current folder. If you don't, uh, then when you fetch the outputs, you'll get an error message, or I beg your pardon, a warning message um, similar to, to what we see here, which is that um, if, if when, when you submit a job to the cluster, MATLAB has to start somewhere. And so it just says, okay, well, why don't we start in the same directory I'm sitting in on my host machine right now, which when I submitted this was in the C users directory. Well, C colon slash users doesn't exist uh, on the cluster. And so therefore the job will be executed from Truba home R Norris, which is my home directory. Uh, and so to uh, avoid this warning message, uh, you can specify the current folder to period. Now, what you also could do is you could set current folder to be, we'll say, Truba Home R Norris slash proj5 slash uh, January, right? So you could set it to any uh, valid uh, directory, and that's where MATLAB will start. If you don't specify, if you don't care where it starts, then you could just use period, and it will start in your home directory. And if you don't mind the warning message, well, then you could you can leave off the current folder. But in all the examples you'll see this afternoon, uh, you'll see that we use current folder set to period. All right, so that's our first sort of hello world example. What I'd like folks to do now, uh, so Jonathan, if you could post uh, the link to the to the workshop content. Um, again, this we'll, we will also post uh, this content uh, on the, uh, the, the Truba site um, at a later date. Um, but you, you will have access to, to this now. Um, you should still be logged in to the FTP site, but if you're not, you would use the same Lakeside account uh, to, to, uh, to log in. So I'm going to ask everyone uh, to take a moment to, um, to log into the FTP site, specifically to this tiny URL, and in doing so, you will see um, a list of workshops. Same thing, um, you only need to download either for Linux, Mac OS users, or the zip for, uh, for Windows users. So go ahead um, and download the appropriate uh, zip file, or a big pardon, archive file. And take a moment to do that. Okay, so let me walk folks through uh, where we're going to install the workshop uh, files. So similar but not identical, for the Windows users, we're going to install it uh, into user path, but for this, we're going to actually create it uh, in a subdirectory uh, so that when you um, install it, it should actually get extracted here. Um, and so that means that you will now see a subfolder called MATLAB dash workshop okay so we don't want it uh, we don't want to extract it actually we don't want all the contents of that um, cluttering the um, uh, your documents MATLAB uh, folder but instead we're going to create it when you extract it it will automatically create a folder called MATLAB dash workshop so I'll do that again let me go so we're going to take our zip our, our uh, zip file we're going to extract it uh, here into user path, and when we do so, it will create a subfolder called MATLAB-workshop. Let me flip over to the Linux uh, users. So um, we should already have the documents MATLAB directory, and in this case here, 
we're going to tar extract file tilde slash matlab dash parallel dash workshop dot uh, tgz and then uh, dash capital C tilde documents matlab. And if we take a look at matlab dash workshop, we will see a list of some of the files that we'll use today. Okay, let me go back just uh, to, for the Windows users and um, a check mark to your, next to your name, please, uh, once you've gotten this far. Excellent. Great. So let's um, uh, jump back over to MATLAB. And what we're going to do now is we're going to, uh, sorry, there was a question. Uh, Jonathan, did you see the, the question that was posted? I think, there was a, I think there was a question as to where to get um, the files. Uh, did, did you see the posting, Jonathan? Okay, so um, so there was a question, um, where do we get the MATLAB parallel zip file? And so uh, Jonathan had posted, I believe, is that right? Was that? Uh, maybe not. Okay. Okay. Is it in the same FTP directory than the support package, Raymond? Uh, it's not. Uh, it's. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll post it in the uh, URL. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so I, I've put into the chat um, the tiny URL. Um, so by clicking on that and then going to, uh, and then uh, Alex posted uh, the username and password as a reminder. <clears throat> um, and, and so in doing so, you should see, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you should see uh, Tubitec uh, workshop, and then you will see the, uh, the zip file and the, um, the tar file. So, all right, great. All right, so I, I mentioned that by placing this as a subdirectory, uh, that this will not be on your MATLAB path. So in order to get access to these files, what I'm gonna ask you to do um, is to CD to full file, user path, MATLAB-workshop, okay? So full file, it, it concatenates user path and MATLAB workshop. And when you do that, you should, within the MATLAB environment, you should see um, all the other uh, workshop files. All right, um, so we're gonna focus on uh, one example uh, today, uh, which is um, estimating uh, pi or calculating the area under the curve to, to, uh, to, to estimate pi. And there's, there's actually a couple of ways that we could do this. Um, uh, I'm gonna, last uh, month we focused a lot on uh, par four. I, I just wanna explain a little bit more about what an SPMD block is, and, and so I'll show you that in the next slide. But really what we're gonna do is uh, by calculating uh, pi, we're going to segment um, the, 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 the curve um, into n number of processes or workers. Uh, so in this case here, what we're gonna do is we're going to take the integral from A to B, um, A1 to B1, A2 to B2, et cetera, um, and then sum up um, our integrations uh, to get uh, to, to calculate pi, right? All right. So the way that we're going to do this um, is using an SPMD block. Now, we could write a, a parallel for loop to do the same, but again, I, I want to focus a little on SPMD and how it works. Um, 
<clears throat> so an SPMD is single program, multiple data. It's highlighted in blue, which tells us that it's a built-in keyword. And it is one of um, our two main parallel constructs. The other one, of course, being PAR4. Um, where PAR4 is how do we run code faster, SPMD typically is focused more around um, how do we work with distributed arrays uh, and so forth. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to um, create, uh, calculate our lower bound and upper bound of our integral by chunking um, our curve. And the way that we're going to do this is using lab index and num labs. Num labs is the number, the total number of workers. Um, and and we're, we'll talk about um, how to start a parallel pool in, in a moment, but let's just say for the sake of discussion that we've started up four workers. So the MATLAB function num labs will, will, will return the number four. Lab index is the way that we identify any one of those workers. Sometimes this is referred to as um, the, the worker's rank. So lab index will return either one, two, three, or four, right, because there are four labs. So lab index uh, one minus one is zero divided by four gets a zero. And lab index of one divided by four gets us a quarter, right? So this is all running on worker one. But it's also all running on worker two and worker three and worker four all at the same time, right? So this code is being run on each of the workers. It's going to have a different value for A and B because the lab index is different. This will go from uh, zero to a quarter. Worker two, two minus one is one divided by four is a quarter and two minus four is a half. So it'll go from one quarter to one half and so forth. All right, we're then going to print our subintervals, lower bound and upper bound. We're then going to take the integral of our quadratic, and then we're going to um, pass in our lower bound and upper bound. Again, this is happening on each one of the workers. Much different than a, a, a par four, which also operates on um, different workers, uh, but this is all happening at the exact same time. My integral will be the local uh, integration from A to B, right? It's going to have a slightly different verge of very uh, value for each one of the workers. So A and B are unique. My integral is also unique for each one of the workers. And here we will print uh, the lower bound, the upper bound, and then what the integral is for that. Um, uh, for that uh, segment. The last thing that we need to do is we've got these individual summations uh, or individual uh, integrations. Now what we want to do is we want to sum all those integrations together. And then we're going to do that using a global operation called G plus. So G is global and plus is um, the operation that we're doing, right? So um, a, a global addition and we're going to globally add my integral. All the workers are communicating to each other. And in all likelihood, what's probably happening under the hood is that everyone is sending their value to lab index one. Lab index one is probably adding all the values and then it's broadcasting the results back out to all the workers so that pi approximate is the same value on all of the workers. So we have uh, unique values for A, B, and my integral, and we have replicated values from pi approximate. The SPMD block has a built-in barrier that will not continue until all the workers have finished uh, running. Actually, it has, a, it has a barrier at G plus because we can't do a global operation here until um, all, all the workers have calculated my integral. To finish this off, uh, we're going to, outside of the workers that are running right here, now we're going to assign a, a variable called uh, prox, uh, approx one, and we're going to assign it to uh, pi approx, which is right here, uh, and we're going to index into the first element. So pi approximate is a one by four cell array uh, because there are four workers, but because they're all the same value, we, all we have to do is index into the first element. And then we finish off simply uh, calculate or displaying what MATLAB says pi is, what our approximate value is, 
that we calculated and what, um, uh, how, what our error rate was. The last thing I would show you is that if you look at integral and we're passing in the name of a function, you know, using a function handle, uh, which is described down below here, that's just like what we were doing earlier with the batch command, right? So batch at the name of our function. Uh, so this is a delayed call to quad pi because we're passing in a pointer to that function um, rather than actually calling quad pi right now, which we wouldn't want to do, obviously. All right. So let's talk about, now that we have our code, uh, let's talk about where are we going to start our parallel pool, right? Um, so I'm going to take a, a slight tangent here for a second. Um, the, in this example here, um, for I equals, par 4 I equals 1 to 8, we're going to create a variable A, um, uh, index into it with IDX and assign it to RAN, right? So pr pretty simple. So the question is, is um, where do we start our parallel pool? Um, so what we learned back in, uh, back in June is that actually a par 4 will automatically start uh, a, a, a parallel pool for us if one hasn't started. But it's possible that we want to override the default number of workers that starts up uh, by explicitly calling par pool. Well, the problem here is that uh, when we call our function, we, we start up a parallel pool of four workers, um, and now we run our parallel for loop, and then we said, oh, actually, you know, instead of eight, um, we wanted to uh, make it 16. Uh, so what's going to happen the next time uh, we run this code? Well, as we remember uh, last month, if we try to call par pool a second time, we will get an error saying that we've already started an interactive session. You can only have one parallel pool running at a time. So it's not a good idea, it's not a good recommended practice to uh, make explicit calls to par pool within your code. And I was talking about this earlier, that you want to differentiate or, or separate, rather, um, the resources that you need, like compute, with your actual code. So if we're not going to embed the call to par pool within our code, uh, where do we start the parallel pool if we want to call it explicitly? Well, we can do it from the command window, right? The command window, we can call par pool. Um, we could have MATLAB automatically start it. Um, we, we mentioned that. Or in the lower left-hand corner, um, we know that there's an icon that we can click and we can start parallel pool. So there's several ways that we can start that parallel pool without actually needing to uh, explicitly call it from within the, um, um, the, the code. All right. So if that's the case, then how are we, when we call the batch command, how do we specify the pool uh, size? And the way that we do that is we're going to include uh, a pool argument to our batch call. And the pool uh, flag will take the size of the pool that you want to start. And by default, if you don't specify a pool, the size of the pool is zero, which is perfectly legitimate. There may be many times that you simply want to offload your code onto the cluster, but don't have it actually paralyze your code, and there's no, uh, there's no need for a pool of processes. All right. So now jumping back to uh, calculating pi, let's uh, jump over to um, – there it is. So now we're going to call uh, assign job. Let, let, let's say uh, job two equals uh, c dot batch. Uh, actually, I need to uh, bear with me for one second. I have to. Um. All right. So uh, job two equals c dot batch at and then calc pi. Uh, it's going to have uh, one output. Ar uh, I'm sorry. Zero output arguments. Uh, we're not going to pass in any input arguments. We're going to set the current folder to uh, period. And we're going to specify 
pool size to be three. Now, I'm going to explain uh, a little bit later uh, in more detail about this, but the, the size of the pool, as uh, Michael was mentioning during his presentation, uh, it, it's very important that your job fits on the node, on the HEMSI node. Uh, and, and so there's actually a, a unique um, number of uh, workers that you can request so that it, it evenly fits into uh, 28 uh, cores uh, on a socket. Um, I'm going to go into a lot more detail about this uh, in a couple of slides, but for the sake of discussion, notice that when we specify a pool of three, that we're requesting actually four tasks, and that's always going to happen. So the size of your pool, if you specify is three, um, then, um, then we're going to add one more for four workers. And the reason that we do that is, uh, let, let's go back to um, the, uh, the code here. When we specify a pool argument, all we're saying is how many workers should be dedicated to your PAR4 or your SPMD block uh, and so forth. But we need another MATLAB process that can run the serial code. So notice that we can interweave parallel and serial code um, together in one file. But in order to do that, we need an additional MATLAB process that can run the serial code, as well as also send these instructions to each one of those workers uh, to, to run and so forth. All right. So, um, <clears throat> right, if, uh, if the size of the pool is three, um, then <clears throat> we're, we're requesting uh, one additional one. Okay, so at this point, let me explain a little bit more about what I'm going to sort of call the power of 28. Um, and so it's important to understand that the Truba cluster <clears throat> is comprised of many nodes, and each node is comprised of uh, two sockets. And a socket is what we place a CPU in, and then that CPU um, has even smaller components called cores, and there are 28 cores uh, per socket. The way that the scheduling policy has been created for running jobs on Truba <clears throat> is that MATLAB has to run <clears throat> on the Hamzy partition or queue primarily, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, primarily because um, the versions of the operating system um, that MATLAB requires are only on Hamzy. All right. So on the Hamzy partition, and, and we, we put this into your um, job submission. You don't have to specify the partition. We do that for you. <clears throat> um, but it does require that your job or that multiples of 28 are being consumed by your job. Um, so the way to think about this is that <clears throat> the number of workers that you request either have to be a factor of 28 or a multiple of 28. <clears throat> and I mean the total number, right? So if you're requesting, <clears throat> I'm sorry, folks, let me. If you request a pool of three workers, where we are really going to ask for four, 28 divided by four is seven. And so therefore, what we will do is we will assign seven computational threads to each one of the workers. So uh, one worker gets seven computational threads times four workers <clears throat> is 28. I'll talk about more than one node uh, in a second. If you, however, um, specify a pool of a number that ultimately is not evenly divisible into um, 28 or a fact, I mean, a multiple of 28, then <clears throat> we throw an error message saying that the prox per node, which is 28, must be evenly divisible by the number of workers. And again, keep in mind that the pool of two is really three workers and 28 does not, um, is not evenly divisible by three. Likewise, if you request more than 28 workers, um, then, the, then the, the size, the number of workers has to be a multiple of it, right? So 55 plus one is 56, and so therefore we will request two nodes. However, if you were to request, we'll say 30 or 40 workers, 
then we'll tell you that the number of workers, which is 31 times the number of threads, uh, must be evenly divisible by 28. It, it got lopped off here, but you would see that in the, uh, in the error message. Okay, so uh, with that said, let's, uh, let's keep going here. Um, so we've submitted our job. Uh, now we want to get the state of the job, and we see that, um, that the state, again, it, that's a property. It starts with a capital letter. Uh, is finished, and so now we're going to go ahead and fetch the results. But notice that when we fetch the results, that nothing came back. So the question is, if we ran our function, um, why is it that we didn't get any outputs? And the reason is because we explicitly told MATLAB that no arguments should get returned. Even if, um, even if the function did return some output arguments, if we specify that none should be returned, we won't see any. Okay. So, so now let's start talking about then how do we get results back? You know, what are the different things that can be returned and, and how do we go about doing that? So there can be function outputs could be returned. Uh, the diary could be something that returns in, uh, output or results um, as well as save files. And we're going to look at each one of these. So we'll use this as an example, uh, test underscore FCN. Uh, we're going to pass in the number of simulations that we want to return, uh, that, that we want to run, and then we're going to return a time argument as well as um, a, a matrix A. We're going to display that we're going to start the simulation. We're going to assign T0 equal to the timer, so we're going to start our timer. Par4 IDX equals um, 1 to the number of simulations that are being passed in. We're going to assign A. This is going to be very quick, so we're going to put a pause in for half a second. We'll display IDX, um, and then once we're done with our PAR4, we will finish, uh, we'll get the time, which will get returned. And then we'll display that we've finished um, our simulations, and we will save the A matrix into a map file called results. All right, so here we go. We, we submit our job. We're going to pass in uh, that we 300, which again is the number of simulations um, that we want to call. Uh, we're going to pass to specify a pool size of six. So again, there's very specific number of pool sizes that we can um, request. A pool size of six is really seven tasks. 28 divided by seven evenly, is evenly divisible by seven means that we're going to assign four computational threads to each one of the workers. All right, so the job has finished. Um, we go to fetch the results and we get a time of 26, 27 seconds. So again, why aren't we getting um, the A matrix? We assigned, uh, we, we, we uh, specified in our prototype um, that, that uh, test underscore FCN returns time T and matrix A. Um, but the reason is because we only requested when we called batch that one output should be returned. And this is a common uh, scenario where <clears throat> instead of, again, T, it could be a status um, where we just need to know if something passed or failed, but we don't necessarily need the A matrix. The problem is that maybe something failed and we wanted that A matrix, right? So how could we go and, and still get the results? So I'll show you that. So the next is that um, we could look at the diary. Um, the diary is a, um, displaying the diary is a method. So job.diary um, will display anything that the MATLAB client running on the cluster would have run. So here we can see that we started the simulation. We can see that um, we're printing out IDX. And notice that 458, so it's not printing out 1, 2, 3, 4 all the way to uh, the number of simulations because the PAR4 can run in any order, right, um, and so forth. So what I didn't, uh, I didn't display everything, including that it was finished. Uh, but the, the, the diary is a really good way of being able to troubleshoot your code to see how far you were able to get to run. All right, so the last thing that we could sort of return is, is files, right? Um, so until um, our 2021B, there was no way of being able to pull files back um, to your uh, client. In 22A, we started creating what's called a data store uh, 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 I'm sorry, a value store and a file store, beg your pardon, a file store. And with a file store, we can actually pull files back. But because we're using 21B here, um, we don't have the seamless ability to copy files back. 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to store uh, my A matrix into a, the, a mat file called results. But the question I have is um, where exactly is results being written to? And the answer actually goes back to the very first example that we ran, which was PWD. If we don't explicitly specify where the results uh, should be written to, then it's going to be written to wherever the MATLAB uh, is being executed on the cluster, which we know is uh, either uh, your home directory or whatever you assigned current folder to, right? So the reason this is important is because at some point I need to use my FTP client to copy the files back and I need to know where I can find it. Okay, so uh, let's move on. There's a, there are other properties actually that you can specify. Um, and um, actually, um, I'm going to probably make an adjustment to the cluster host. Um, and I will let folks know um, when, once that's done, uh, because most folks probably don't need the 172 address. Um, they can use the fully qualified domain name instead. So I'll get that um, updated and that will get pushed out. Um, and then you'll just need to download that, put that into your uh, user path um, and, and you'll be good to go. And then you'll, well, I'll, I'll send out um, some additional um, instructions for that, so. All right, um, but the, really the, the main things that you're going to need to set uh, is the wall time. Uh, the email address is, uh, what we'll talk about uh, in, a, in, a, in a minute. Okay, I want to transition now to um, going from functions to scripts uh, because I do think that a lot of people write MATLAB scripts rather than functions. So I'm going to talk about the behavior that you'll see um, when you're calling scripts. For starters, uh, this is probably an unconventional way of writing a script, uh, but what I've done here, I simply just embedded or inlined uh, in these quotes the code that I want to run. But you could imagine that I could replace all of this uh, with simply just the name of my script, which could be, you know, my script. That's it. Now, because it's a script and not a function, the, the first thing you'll notice is that there's no, um, uh, we don't specify the number of um, uh, output arguments, and there's no input argument list because there's no function header, or no function prototype there that specifies um, th those things. Now, Instead, what we do is we're going to look at all the variables that are in your base workspace or, or college workspace, and we're going to pass those um, at, uh, with the job. Likewise, because we don't know what variables you need passed back, we're going to take all the variables that were created and we're going to pass it back uh, to the MATLAB client as well. And so, as you can imagine, this could be very costly, right? Imagine that. I've got some very large matrix, right? So here I have z equals random three, but imagine this were, you know, a million by a million, right? Well, this might be something I'm doing on my local machine, but you can see that nowhere in my script am I actually referencing z, but MATLAB doesn't know that. So this variable z is going to automatically uh, be attached to the job. And ironically, it's also going to have to come back uh, because perhaps I need uh, z as well. So all variables are are sent back when you're calling a script. So let's take a look. Uh, we're going to clear um, our variable Z just to show what happened. So uh, actually, let me explain here. So job equals C dot batch. Um, the script that we want to call, which again, you don't need to, obviously you don't need to inline. This could just be, you know, my script. Uh, we'll set the current folder to period. Um, and number of tasks is one because pool is not specified. So it defaults to zero. Zero plus one is one. So a single task. Uh, with 28 uh, threads uh, to, to run this code. We're going to clear Z, and so we can see that the only variables are now uh, C, job, and X. We get the state of the job. It's finished. Um, and now to get the results back, we don't fetch the results, but instead we're going to load the job. When we load the job, it's like loading a mat file, because that's almost what we're doing. We're loading all the variables that we stored uh, from the job. And here we can see that we have ants, uh, C, job, temp. There's, you know, here's temp uh, and, and Z. So the question is, is, why are we getting Z? You know, we cleared Z, but now when we look at our workspace, uh, it's brought back. And that's because we assigned uh, or we passed a Z to the job. And so therefore, everything needs to come back. So that includes Z. Well, what about temp? 
Um, temp was never, uh, you know, we, we never even created temp in here. Uh, I'm sorry, we, I'm, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. We did create temp here. Uh, and, and so therefore, this temporary variable that we didn't actually need brought back is also um, being um, uh, uh, brought back to our base workspace. So we can see that um, by not creating, using functions, we sort of lose this contract that we have that specifies what variables need to be sent to the job and what variables need to be brought back. And it's possible that that could be a very costly um, action. So as a strong recommendation, um, um, I would suggest that you always write functions, um, not, not uh, scripts, which may require a little work, rework it in your code, um, and I'll talk more about what that looks like later. Okay, so some other things to think about when we're um, submitting jobs to the cluster is how do we go about um, specifying the path? Should we attach files? Should we um, uh, set client, you know, uh, set the client path and what have you? And so, if uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, the fewer number of files that you can attach to your job, the better off. When MATLAB is going to submit the job to the cluster, it will automatically attach files that it needs on your machine to the job. Well, because you can run lots of these jobs, um, you can imagine that now um, each time that we're submitting the same job, every time we've got to go through and find all the files that are required uh, to attach to the job. So if I had to do a, a, a loose rule of thumb, I might suggest that if your uh, job needs five or 10 of, five of the files that you've written, then I would consider maybe just having MATLAB automatically attach those files. But if you've got four, you know, 40, 50, 100 MATLAB files, maybe you've written your own toolbox, what I would suggest is taking those files, copying onto Truba, and then uh, pointing the MATLAB client uh, to where it can find those files on the cluster. So that way, when you're submitting your job, you're only submitting a, a few number of files to your job. Okay, uh, I mentioned that um, you can specify uh, email notification when your job has um, started and when it's going to finish. And this is very helpful for, for you folks because when you're submitting a job from your machine, <clears throat> you really would have almost no idea uh, when your job's going to start and more importantly, uh, when your job is finished. Because you can quit MATLAB and shut down your uh, your uh, desktop machine, we can log in, uh, we can restart your machine and start MATLAB tomorrow once you've gotten email notification that your job has finished uh, and so forth. So the question then is, okay, um, how do we go about getting the results from a job that we ran several days ago? One of the things that you can do, going to the parallel menu items, you can go to the job monitor. The job monitor, uh, allows you to uh, select any one of the jobs, and then you can uh, either fetch the outputs or you can look at the error files and so forth. So it's not required that when you use the MATLAB batch command that you keep MATLAB running all the time or that your desktop machine is running all the time. You can shut all that down, restart MATLAB another day, and get the results. Uh, it is a good uh, practice to delete the jobs that you don't uh, need anymore. Um, because we use the file system um, to, to track all your jobs, as you submit more and more jobs, uh, it will start to slow MATLAB down uh, if it's got to parse through all the files uh, on your local file system um, that, that, you've, uh, that you've run in the past. So as you have run jobs and you no longer need the jobs, uh, at some point it's a good idea to delete the job. The delete method, uh, or, or delete is a method of job, so you can type job.delete. Uh, you can also, using the job monitor, you can go over and you can click uh, delete there as well. All right, uh, we, we're at the top of the hour. Um, if you don't mind, I just have uh, maybe another uh, four or five slides that I can go through um, quickly, but I just sort of want to finish off um, talking about how we can go uh, troubleshooting and debugging. So I'd love to say that all things work all the time, but in fact, um, they, uh, you know, so sometimes uh, jobs do go awry and it's important to uh, work with the, uh, the Tubatech folks uh, to understand, you know, uh, you know, for troubleshooting and so forth. So first thing that they're gonna wanna know is um, what is the scheduler ID of your job? MATLAB has this notion of a job ID, uh, but Slurm would have an entirely different value. 
So uh, when you're putting in a help uh, ticket, uh, you would not tell them what the MATLAB job ID is, but what you need to know is the scheduler ID. By, so by calling job.getTaskSchedulerids, um, this will tell you the SLURM job ID. So that's the first thing that they need to know. The second is um, any error messages that MATLAB might have captured. Um, so if you uh, if your job throws an error, when you fetch the results, MATLAB will display uh, what the error is. Now it's possible that that error is something that you could fix um, because maybe you've given an invalid, uh, uh, incorrect name or, or, or what have you. So it's just resubmitting the job. Other times it might be because there's a licensing issue, and, and I'm going to talk about that in the tail end. Um, and so for that. Um, they need to, uh, they'll, they'll want to get uh, a capture of the log file. So the way that we can capture the log file is by making a call to get debug log. And getting the log file will display uh, whatever Slurm uh, wrote to disk. So this will be something else that you want to put into the help ticket. All right. Um, I, I want, just as a reminder, uh, for you to remove the reservation. So at this time, bring up MATLAB and and type c.additionalproperties.reservation equals empty string, and then save that profile. So that way for future jobs, you won't be um, uh, using a reservation that's no longer valid. So um, I'm gonna skip over this, this piece here. Um, it, it just talks about some of the things to think about um, to, to make your code more robust um, so that it works uh, when you're running jobs on the cluster. You have access to these slides. Um, and, and the notes, um, so feel free to take a look at here. Um, the last couple of slides here, I just want to talk about, you know, if you start thinking about, you, you now really have this way to be able to run uh, jobs at bulk. Um, and, and so you could imagine that from your MATLAB client um, that you could uh, have, a, have a for loop that says, okay, you know, here's the code that I want to call, um, and I'm going to pass in a collection of different input arguments um, and now we can start launching, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 of these jobs, right? So ideally, you want to get your code to run as quickly as possible, but you may have multiple data sets that you want to be working with. Um, and so now you have the ability, all within the MATLAB environment, to be able to launch those jobs onto the cluster um, and then stay within the MATLAB environment to get the results and do post-processing and so forth. So in this case here, maybe we're going to submit, a, you know, four jobs, uh, and, you know, I'm going to wait for the second job to finish, and then I'm going to get the time of that it took to, to run my second job and so forth. So this is just a very crude example, but it sort of gives you, you know, one idea of, you know, what you could be doing with the batch command. Um, and the last slide that I want to talk about um, actually gets back to Michael's uh, second to last slide that was talking about uh, performances uh, and, and so forth, and, and the trade-off of using something locally versus using Truba. So the things to think about is, in, in Michael's case of, of the workstation, certainly the advantages of using a uh, high-powered workstation is that you get, uh, you know, probably immediate access. I say, you know, probably because maybe other people are using the workstation, uh, but if no one's using it, then you'd have immediate access to it. And licensing is certainly uh, a little bit easier because it's all within the confines of, of your university and so forth. Probably the drawbacks um, is that you have to think about um, the cost of procuring, um, uh, the, the cost and procuring um, additional workstations uh, and so forth. Um, and then what happens to the workstation when it's not being used, you know? Um, so, you know, you, you paid up front for using that workstation, but uh, what value do you get from it if it happens not to be uh, being used? Um, and it can only run one person at a time because of that. Um, if you wanted more people to be using it, then you'd have to procure more workstations. Conversely, using uh, something like Truba, the advantage is that there's an, an enormous number of nodes um, that you have access to. And because of that, you have the ability to, to run um, many jobs or, or at least submit many jobs at, at a time using the batch command um, and then let the scheduler uh, figure out when it can actually run your jobs. Um, you know, the drawback could be that, you know, depending on the workstation, it's, it's possible that um, the workstation may be more powerful than it on, on a one given node. But again, you have lots of nodes that you have access to. Um, so it's, um, you know, uh, certainly uh, you have a value with running on Truba. Um, I'm the, on the last slide, which is the next one, I'm going to talk about configuring your MATLAB licensing because there is a piece there. Today we've been using a trial uh, uh, 
uh, license from Adler Federal Server. Um, I'll, I'll explain in a second what you'll need to do uh, if you want to get started as well. And then obviously, you know, you need to transfer files and data over to TrueBug, you know, which you'd have to do for the workstation anyway, but, you know, maybe it takes a little bit more work to do that. Okay, so last slide, how do we get started? Um, if this is something that uh, you would have uh, an interest in uh, doing, first and foremost is that you have to um, have Truba be able to find your parallel server license. And the best thing to do is to get in touch um, with, uh, with, with the Truba folks. Um, they can get in touch with us as well and we can help uh, configure because the university, your universities do have uh, MATLAB parallel server. We just need to have Truba point to your parallel server license um, and then you'll have access to this as well. Okay, so we talked a lot about um, this afternoon. I apologize, we ran a few minutes over. Uh, but really the key takeaways, uh, key takeaway, are um, that we call config cluster uh, in order to create the true profile um, that we need to uh, we'll prototype um, our code locally on our host machine uh, but then we'll use the true profile to be able to submit multi-core multi-node jobs uh, on, onto the cluster that we can tune the parameters uh, using additional properties to get things like email notification and wall time um, and that there are best practices for submitting your jobs whether it's um, how we get um, files transferred over uh, to your to, to run your job, how we get uh, how we do error handling with things like um, getting um, the, the schedule ID, um, getting error messages, getting um, debug log files, and so forth. And that in the end, if this is something that you feel would be of benefit and value, um, all of this is readily available, and that you should start with the two protect folks um, to help um, get you started for your next step. So. Uh, and with that, um, I've um, concluded my slides. Uh, unless there's any questions, I'm going to hand it back over to Alex. I see that in the meantime, uh, uh, Truba has posted a useful email address for uh, request of support. Okay, so what what arrived, Raymond? It, it's been, yeah, two hours of, of delivering content. So uh, let me thank you for uh, the content itself and the energy that you have put in uh, in, in presenting. And uh, also, uh, once more, uh, let us thank all the organization and, and people that have allowed us to uh, run this workshop uh, in premise uh, uh, Tubitac that manages the, the Truba cluster uh, we had guest presenters from Bill Kent University, the Simply Complex Lab. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, a number of people have been uh, working in the background, uh, uh, addressing questions, answering. Let me mention one for all. Uh, Jonathan, thanks a lot for your help and support. The meeting has been uh, recorded and a uh, copy of the PowerPoint presentation will be made available to the attendees likely uh, next week, we'll have to do a little of edit and changes, but then we will reach you and uh, share locations where you will be able to download uh, the presentations and the recording of, uh, of the workshop. With this, you have been very uh, patient uh, following us for uh, more than two hours. Uh, thanks a lot. Have a good day. Bye. Alex, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. So, uh, Mustafa, I'd like to answer your question. How can we run simulate files along with MATLAB scripts on Truebo? So, uh, that's a good question. There's, um, there are two.